five years handling um, uh, mostly DNA cases, although some non-DNA cases, and now I'm teaching evidence in criminal law and criminal procedure here. Um, uh, so that's, that's why I'm here. And we're here to, to talk about um, the standard, how this evidence gets in and why, and then give some, some commentary on um, kind of how the standard has worked in practice. And then if there's time, I'll, I'll introduce a few brief cases from, that I worked on at the Innocence Project that involved scientific evidence um, uh, in the courtroom that turned out to be um, less, than, less than accurate. Um, so first, why do we even have this question? Um, you know, why are we forced to, to address this question of, of the admissibility of scientific evidence or any expert testimony? Um, and, and the question seems like it could be kind of really general at first. Um, after all, we allow lay witnesses to testify and give their opinion under certain circumstances in trials. Um, why do we need special rules for experts? And, and the analysis, I think, is quite intuitive, but um, for the most part is that, that juries might give too great of weight to someone who qualifies themselves as an expert, right? To someone who stands, um, uh, sits behind the witness stand and says, I, based on these, ex uh, these qualifications, I can give you my opinion um, without having ever perceived any of the things that are at issue in the trial, right? They weren't a witness to the crime. They weren't a um, uh, friend of any of the people. They just review some facts and they say, this is my opinion. Well, for the most part, we have these rules because we want to make sure that the jury just doesn't blindly follow the expert's lead um, because they do carry great weight. Um, so as has been introduced, the, um, the Supreme Court um, came to this late. Right? First, we had this test um, from the Fry Standard from 1923 um, that set out a test for when experts can give testimony in court. And to sum it up in, in one line, as Dr. Bohan uh, earlier did, was um, so long as the technique was generally accepted in the scientific community, it could be used and qualified as expert testimony and the witness um, could, um, could testify. Um, this quickly gave way, in, well not quickly, but gave way about 70 years later um, um, when the Supreme Court finally interpreted the Federal Rule of Evidence, here's the Federal Rule of, e Rule of Evidence 702, and said now, at least in federal court, and now in the vast majority of states they follow 702, um, the rule for admissibility is not whether or not the um, scientific evidence is generally accepted in the scientific, scientific community, um, we have to go through a kind of a more rigorous test. And here's the test. It boils down to kind of two main questions. Um, and I think the two questions can be summarized as, um, does this discipline, whatever the discipline is, um, is it founded on some kind of re reliable scientific methodology? Now there's a, a big caveat, right? Because as we've just learned, it doesn't ha this rule doesn't just apply to what we think of as science. It could also t uh, apply to um, a burglar testifying that these tools are tools that are burglary tools, right? You can qualify a convicted burglar to be an expert on what constitutes a burglary tool, right? So it doesn't, it's not just scientific testimony. And then the second question is um, uh, kind of whether these disciplines rely on some kind of human interaction, making them susceptible to human error or biases, right? Are they reliable? Um, Basically, the court has to ask and address kind of these two questions. Would this evidence be helpful? Is it beyond common sense of the jury? Um, and then is the testimony reliable? And then in answering this reliability question, um, the court gives us, at least starts giving us a list of factors, right? And the court says these aren't, the, aren't all of the factors, but these are at least the factors the court gives us in the, in the case um, to go down. Um, has this technique been tested? Um, has it been subject to peer review? Do we know an error rate? Um, which it turns out in many of the forensic science disciplines, we just don't know an error rate. Um, is the um, uh, discipline uh, subject to standards and controls? And then filing, we get the addition of the Fry test um, as the fifth factor. But the court also said there are other factors that, um, that apply. Um, so, what are some theories behind Daubert? What are, we, what are we accepting when the court gives us the standard for addressing the question of how are we going to allow expert testimony in our courts? Well, these are some that I think are kind of back up this theory. Um, first, we're starting out, the federal rules, the whole design of the federal rules of evidence is to get evidence to the jury, right? It's supposed to be permissive. It's supposed to allow the trier of fact to hear as many, as many um, facts or 
not facts as possible so they can do their best job deciding the case. That's kind of the thrust of, of the rules. And I think Daubert follows that motivation. The desire is to get the evidence to the jury. Uh, um, it's also based on this idea that individual disciplines will self-regulate. Um, there's at least some presumption that whoever's practicing these techniques will keep some level of regulation. Now maybe it's certification in some uh, technical discipline, which may or may not be um, uh, indicative of how good the discipline is, but there's something there. Um, or that just the science, the process of science itself, trying to replicate and not replicate what someone else did, there'd be some kind of level of self-regulation. Um, I think there's another theme here behind it that we, the Daubert presumes a, a huge level of confidence in juries and in the adversarial system, and I should add it, and, and in judges, to kind of decide what is reliable and what's not. Now we can talk about, and I think the question, the next question has to be, is that a good presumption? Is it a valid presumption? Should we presume that juries can sort these things out? Or should we presume that defense attorneys can adequately bring them to light and that judges can make the right determination um, so as it, uh, to prevent a jury from kind of relying on what an expert says blindly? <coughs> Um, and then the last one, um, can the judge serve as an adequate, adequate gatekeeper? So one of the things I want to turn to next, and I think we'll have um, several things to say about this, is kind of how it's worked. How has Daubert worked in action? We've heard a lot of um, stories about this already today, but one of the aspects is um, kind of how is Daubert applies in civil cases and in criminal cases. We've talked, the majority of our uh, discussion here has been in the criminal context. So I think it's helpful to at least get some analysis of how it works um, in these two venues because they're, they're different, right? In a civil case, no one's liberty is at stake. Someone might lose a lot of money. Um, but in a criminal case, someone might lose their life or, or their liberty. Um, so um, I think Randy has some thoughts on kind of this uh, distinction between Daubert's um, applicability in civil, the civil context versus the uh, criminal context. Hi, y'all. Uh, my name is Randy Papetti. I'll give you the briefest of introductions uh, to make clear the limits of my expertise on what I'm going to talk about. If you go into the lobby at the law school here, there is a big sign that refers to Lewis Roca Rothgerber. It's the Lewis Roca Rothgerber uh, lobby at the law school here. And I'm a partner at Lewis Roca Rothgerber, which is a large, uh, might be described as corporate law firm. We are not a criminal defense law firm. Uh, we certainly are not a group of scientists uh, that study some of these issues. But in my day-to-day -day practice, uh, experts play an enormous role. Um, they play a role in cases involving pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, did this particular drug cause a birth defect or some other problem? They play a role in economic issues that come up and have to be discussed. Um, and they play a role, obviously, to the extent we have any involvement in criminal cases. And I have uh, played a supporting role in several cases involving um, deaths of children where medical testimony has been used as the primary, if not the sole basis, to declare the person uh, guilty, supposedly, of abuse. Um, and in your roles as journalists, you'll constantly, I am sure, come across the need to rely or solicit uh, the opinions of experts. It's simply a fact of life in trying to figure out any sort of issue. Uh, you tend to turn to experts. So on the more specific topic of how is this all working and how is it applied, uh, this Daubert thing, uh, worked out for uh, in, in the criminal context, I'd, I'd like to point something out. That, that Daubert was considered a major revision in the law concerning uh, the role of experts in court proceedings was considered a big deal. And the reason Daubert came about was not because of anybody looked at the rule and intellectually thought that the rule that existed was uh, not acceptable. That had been around a long time. The reason it came about was because of money. Companies were getting creamed in court proceedings where experts were coming in and saying, I can tell you that that birth defect was caused by this drug, or I can tell you why that ship sunk. Um, there had been issues raised in criminal cases, there had been issues raised in other contexts, but once people started figuring out that they were losing uh, half a billion dollar judgments because of expert testimony that they were positive was not reliable, 
uh, it started getting some traction. And so there's been three major Supreme Court cases, Daubert and two others since then, uh, that have refined the Daubert standard. And it's not a surprise that all those were civil cases. And they involve enormous companies like General Electric uh, and a big pharmaceutical company and uh, tire manufacturers. Um, and that's uh, because those companies have the money to engage in the process that's been set up under Daubert where you hire the best experts and you study all the <coughs> literature on both sides uh, and you have hearings that can cost a million dollars for the hearing. That doesn't happen in the criminal context. So Daubert has played a major role in the civil context. It has given uh, typically defense parties an enormous opportunity to protect themselves against sort of unfair or un, uh, unreliable expert testimony that didn't exist. But those kinds of resources aren't available in the criminal context. Uh, and there are other reasons why it hasn't applied as well in the criminal context as well. The experts that tend to be giving opinions that would be subject to Daubert uh, are not kind of a fringe but perhaps charismatic expert that uh, had uh, such success in some of the older plaintiff's cases. They tend to be people that come with a lot of uh, cloak of credibility. In the criminal cases, you might have someone from a crime lab. People have a lot of respect for people to come in and talk uh, from a crime lab. In the shaken baby cases, they're child abuse pediatricians from the local children's hospital. People tend to believe, uh, to, to believe and want to believe they can rely on them. They might be fire investigators. Everybody likes firemen and assume firemen uh, uh, certainly like dogs. You know, we're trying to do their, to do their best. So in the criminal context, Daubert has been uh, nothing short of a train wreck. It's had relatively little effect. Um, it is only now, uh, I'd say, the, the, the first time I read anything was about 2005 where someone said, hey, how come Daubert's not doing anything in the criminal context? It's only now starting to be seriously considered uh, in, in many criminal cases. Um, and I, there really is no better explanation other than number one, money, and number two, the experts whose work that will be challenged that's been accepted for so long uh, are people that judges have relied on every single day uh, and that most people in the public would regard as credible. Let me just add a, a, a couple of statistics from, that I think give um, some background to what R Randy just said. So um, with respect to the kind of civil versus criminal dichotomy, so there's been several studies about this and we can challenge and look at the, the um, kind of methods that they use, but one of the studies focused just on federal court. So um, as we know, the vast majority of criminal cases happen in state court, so there's some limitations here. But this study found that um, if we looked at the Daubert challenges in the civil context, right, so all civil litigation where it's about money, 90% of the um, cha Daubert challenges were bought, brought by defendants, right? So this is the big company who's being sued. Um, in the federal court system, um, in the criminal context, 10% of the Daubert challenges were brought by defendants, right? And so it's almost flipped. Um, and this is federal court, so the, there's some limitations. Um, similar studies have demonstrated that the um, kind of rate of who wins in a Daubert challenge is also remark remarkably kind of skewed. Um, so Michael Reisinger, a law professor, documented that, again, it's in federal court. Um, defense challenges to government expert testimony succeeded less than 10% of the time. Um, so this is the defendant saying, hey, bite marks aren't reliable. Um, the defense wins less than 10% of the time in this study. It was from the early 2000s. Um, same time period, same, same federal court. Government challenges to defense experts succeeded two thirds of the time. Right? So we have to ask why. The study doesn't go, it speculates about why, but it's, it, it makes sense to ask why. Why um, should this standard that should be kind of fair across um, uh, whoever the players um, are in the system come out with such skewed results? Um, one, of the, one of the reasons might be kind of the cases in which the envelope is pushed, right? The, the forensic science envelope or the science envelope is pushed. And I'll, I'll just mention a couple of them. Um, of cases that I was involved with um, as just kind of data points to consider. This is a picture of Clarence Simmons. He was one of my clients when I was a, a staff attorney in Georgia um, at the Southern Center for Human Rights. He was on death row in Alabama at the time this photo was taken. He served 16 years on death row before he died. 
um, what happened in his case and why is it a forensic science or a science issue? Um, so this isn't a case of innocence. Um, Mr. Simmons brutally murdered a woman, um, an elderly woman in Jefferson County, Alabama. Uh, no question he did it. The question was, the prosecutor couldn't find a theory for which to give Mr. Si Mr. Simmons a death, a death sentence. There's certain types of crimes. You kill a police officer, you kill more than one person, um, uh, you kill a child, um, can qualify um, a regular murder to be elevated to a capital murder. The prosecutor couldn't find a, a, a theory in Mr. Simmons' case despite a very, very brutal murder. So what did they do? They called in um, an expert from the FBI, the Behavioral Analysis Unit, um, and said, um, we need some help. We need to figure out why he committed this crime. Um, so they got a profiler, um, but they said, we don't, really, we don't need the kind of normal reason why we have a profiler to find the suspect. We already know who did it. We have the suspect. We want to know why. Um, so this profiler said, I can tell you why. Send me the photos from the crime scene. Send me the police reports, and I'll tell you why. So he reviewed the photos, reviewed the police reports, and said, um, I'm an expert in victimology. Um, and I can study the victim, and I can, dem and I can conclude because of the way this woman was um, stabbed, uh, Mr. Simmons got sexual gratification during this stabbing. Um, didn't talk to Mr. Simmons, didn't have any um, uh, of Mr. Simmons' uh, um, extensive um, kind of mental health and medical records, just had the photos from the crime scene and the, um, and the police reports. Um, and the judge in this case ultimately said, that flies, you meet the Daubert standard, you can come in to testify um, as an expert in victimology, which is a, a real field, but I think this was a, a misuse of a real field. Um, and Mr. Simmons was sentenced to death um, uh, and spent, as I mentioned, 16 years before he died of, of, of natural causes on uh, death row in Alabama. So the motivation wasn't to find someone, the motivation wasn't, it was just a, simply a motivation to elevate this to a capital crime. And I think that in, in some instances, that can skew how Daubert is applied. Now here's another example that goes the other way. Um, this is one of my clients um, from the Innocence Project who is um, still in prison in Kentucky for a murder of his um, uh, girlfriend. So at the time, he was about 20 years old and he and his friend were um, initial suspects because his girlfriend was found dead, stabbed in a field about 45 minutes from where they lived. Um, and the question was the same thing. The prosecutor was seeking to find a way to charge Mr. Hardin with a capital crime. Um, Mr. Hardin said, I didn't do it, I didn't have anything to do with this. Um, but none, nonetheless, he was arrested, he was in the crosshairs of the prosecution, and, um, uh, and the prosecutor kind of pushed ahead with their theory of how they could make this a capital crime. So it wasn't a crime, it wasn't a, a killing during a sexual assault, would have made it, which would have made it a capital crime. The victim wasn't a police officer, didn't meet any of the other justifications in Kentucky for making it a capital crime. Um, but one justification is if you kill someone for money, if you kill someone for pecuniary gain, you're hired to kill someone, you rob them while you kill someone, then in Kentucky it, it can be eligible for the death penalty. Um, so that wasn't even present in this case on its face. So how did the prosecutor try to convince a judge that Mr. Hardin should face death um, he said, Mr. Hardin, um, he said, I'm going to get an expert, and he did. I got an expert on Satanism. <laughs> Turns out Mr. Hardin, um, at this time in the early 90s, wore a trench coat. Um, he wore all black. Um, he had some literature in his home that was about Satanism. He also listened to heavy metal. Um, he collected snakes. Um, he had some daggers um, in his um, possession. Um, and so the prosecutor said, I'm going to get an expert in Satanism. This expert in Satanism looked at the crime scene photos, um, looked at the evidence that they got from Mr. Hardin's um, bedroom, um, other evidence they collected, and said, yeah, Mr. Hardin's into Satanism. And, um, and this is the, the kind of effort to get it capitalized, he didn't get paid by Satan for this, but his reward was not you know, money like we think of money, but he elevated his um, status in the, um, in, in the kind of bank of Satan. Literally, they make this argument, right? So he elevated his stand status with, quote, the Antichrist. Therefore, this murder was done for pecuniary gain. Um, therefore, this should be a capital murder. Now, this is an example, right? So this is an example where the court said, this is too far, right? I, I have Daubert, or as they say in, in Meade County, Kentucky, Daubert. Um, I know about Daubert, and um, uh, you, Satanism expert, can testify that Mr. Hardin is a Satanist, and this crime was motivated by Satan. But this is just simply too far to allow me to make this a, to, to make this a capital crime. 
um, on based on that theory. So he was prevented from testifying to the ultimate thing. It wasn't a, wasn't um, elevated to a capital crime. It was a regular murder crime. Mr. Hardin was convicted. He's fighting still now. Um, turns out the victim had uh, several hairs clenched in her hand. Um, it was a, a, a brutal killing, close range. She was stabbed. Um, that they said were Hardin's hairs um, at time based on microscopic hair comparison. We did the DNA testing. It turns out they weren't Hardin's hairs. They weren't the victim's hairs. We don't know who's, whose hairs they were. We're still trying to find that out. He's kind of stuck where Ray was for a little while before you could figure out the actual perpetrator. Um, but nonetheless, um, he's kind of much closer to having his conviction overturned than he was um, was a while um, before. Um, there are several other cases that um, we can talk about. Um, this one is, is kind of a, a case from Mississippi, Kennedy Brewer. Same story that Ray had, or very similar story. There's some wrinkles, right? Three-year-old girl, um, the daughter of Brewer's girlfriend goes missing while he's babysitting, right? So this, this three-year-old goes missing. Um, Brewer and oops, um, calls the police, and his girlfriend called the police right away. She's missing. Uh, they have a hunt. A couple days later, the little girl's body is found in a stream near their house. Um, so the pathologist <coughs> looks at the body and says, there's a whole bunch of bite marks on here, I think. But I'm not an expert in that. So I'll call my buddy Dr. West, a forensic odontologist. And Dr. West says, I've seen 19 bite marks on this body. But it's kind of weird because these, bite mark, but because these bite marks only have impressions from the upper teeth, right? There's no bottom teeth on the bite marks. The doctor's like, well, first just imagine this. Imagine eating an apple with your upper teeth, right? It doesn't work. You can't do this. So Dr. West said, well, Mr. Brewer has some, I'm sorry, these are jumping ahead. Mr. Brewer has really blunt bottom teeth. Um, and he matches at these 19 bite marks. Um, comes in, he's convicted, he goes to, to uh, Parchment Farm, sentenced to death. Um, uh, fortunately, he keeps fighting. Um, keeps fighting, asks for um, DNA testing, gets really, really lucky because another crime happened three miles away where another little girl was found dead. Another guy was convicted. Dr. West did the same bite mark analysis, same only top teeth, um, uh, and um, that's LeVon Brooks, who was convicted in this other crime. But fortunately, years later, they find the DNA evidence, and it turns out that it wasn't Mr. Brooks, it wasn't Mr. Brewer. It was just um, this guy, who was an early suspect in both cases. The police reports listed him as the first suspect, Mr. Johnson here. Um, he confesses after being confronted with the DNA evidence. Um, Dr. West no longer testifies. Turns out that he was actually making the impressions on the body um, with the mold of the teeth, and you can see this on the video. Um, the NAS report has since said that this isn't um, obviously the um, right way to do it. This was the last slide I had, right? So what's the challenge to you, your journalists, right? We had this natural experiment happening right now in Phoenix. You're, I'm sure everyone's seen this in the news, right? So we have these 11 shootings. Um, police didn't know who, who did them. There was you know, pretty much a frenzy going on in Phoenix to solve these, rightfully so. Um, and then they find this gun at a pawn shop that's supposedly this guy's gun. I can't remember his name. Leslie Merritt, I believe. Merritt? Junior. Leslie Merritt Jr., right? Whose gun was found at a pawn shop, um, pawned at the same time. The police go get the gun. They shoot it in their lab at DPS. And they say the four bullets from the first four shootings match the bullets from their test shootings of this gun, right? So they're using ballistics to do this. Um, Merritt says at his first court appearance, my gun's been in the pawn shop for two, two months. I, haven't, I don't even have access to it. Now, I don't know, Merritt. I don't know anything about this case. But I do know that there's a story to be written. Um, because DPS doesn't say, um, we've matched it on these four, four cases. And we know the error rate for this test, this method of ballistics. Right? They don't say that. They just say, we've matched it. It's his gun, um, and it wasn't there. Now, maybe he's lying. Maybe the gun wasn't in the pawn shop. But we, we can know in this natural experiment. So there's some. Um, op-ed or reporting to be done um, on this case. Um, and I think it, it presents a natural experiment that will kind of keep going in the next, uh, next few months, at least here, this bite mark. Um, but he, he isn't testifying in Mississippi. But Mississippi, and Mississippi has, has still continued to defend cases in which he yes. did testify. Yes. So cases are ongoing, but he's not testifying. Well, this ties into the line you were saying, which is certainly true, the assumption that the disciplines will uh, self-regulate. 
Uh, Dr. West was expelled from the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. The American Academy of Forensic Sciences had to defend a lawsuit he brought against it. Um, this was years and years ago. Um, and yet prosecutors would continue to use him. So, you know, the discipline by the, di I mean, the, uh, the discipline by the discipline is not enough if prosecutors are going to continue to use these people and judges are going to continue to accept them. And he had the blue light, too, as I recall. He had a special blue light. It actually, my cousin was involved in my case in like Mark Solis. Roz and West apparently were two cohorts that hung out apparently together. Uh, some of the mission. The way my cousin posed as a private investigator from Nevada said they had a child abuse case. It was important. They didn't really have evidence, but they think this was, a, was, was the person that did it. They said his teeth marks. He said his bite mark, dentition, my cousin had made of his own. Used the pictures from my crime and sent them to Dr. West. And Dr. West positively identified him without a doubt. Indeed, and not. <laughs> This is, a, let me just add, this is remarkable. There have been a bunch of studies that a um, scientist named Etiel Dror has done doing exactly this, right? You could do a natural experiment with a fingerprint. So the first one he did was he sent actual crime scene prints to six experts who previously had called it a match, right? And he's, he's sending the actual data from that crime scene with some other kind of story behind it. The story, in, in this case, the story was, um, these are the prints from the Brandon Mayfield case, this notorious case from Portland, um, which the FBI admitted after the fact that they got it wrong, right? And these scientists who had, or these fingerprint anal analysts who had looked at the same prints in, in prior work and called it a match, now with the cue that this was, these are the prints from the Mayfield case, which are supposed to not be a match, they're not a match, three of them changed their mind. Oh. Two of them said, I don't know anymore, I can't make a decision. But one of them stood by his testimony, right? And he said, I know these are supposedly from the Mayfield case, but these are still a match. And he's re replicated this, and there are several papers um, dealing with this. This is the same experiment that, that Ray's cousin did. Um, am I also correct that they did a blind test? As you listened to one of your things there about the, the, uh, the, the, the performance rate ratio, whatever the, the name was, about how accurate it was, reliable were their tests. Did, not, did they not do one on bite mark blind tests or whatever? It was only some like 40% or whatever that they did? Yes. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's enough being done to thoroughly vet these experts. And the reason I ask is I used to work in Alabama, um, which has a lot of people on death row. Um, there was an expert in a capital murder case who was to testify for the defense. And this expert had a bogus college degree from a diploma in and that's one of the stories I did. But is enough being done to vet these experts? I mean, I, I can speculate. And I think that, um, um, you know, no is the first answer. But the kind of more um, interesting part is why is that the case? And I think Randy hit on, you know, resources is why. Um, uh, Ray said his public defender, I think, was given five grand um, initially, right? In Alabama, it's less. Um, to defend a capital case. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think it, it comes down to that. Um, Daubert is designed to do that, and judges could catch these things, uh, but there is still this reliance on the fact that the kind of argument between the prosecutor and the defense attorney will get to some kind of truth. Um, and that's just a different truth than the truth that science would give us sometimes. Not always, but sometimes. I'm sorry to interrupt. There's also the, the issue in Alabama, for you who don't know, they're, all their judges down there are elected. The small counties and judges, run, they're running for election. They're running on death back and death penalty cases. They can't be, be too nice to the defense and the families because that's all their area. There, there's a lot of stuff that happens in Alabama. It's all because those judges are elected frequently by the people that live right there in their community. I guess that was kind of my question. You talked a lot about these um, prosecutors pushing for it to be what do they have to gain by elevating? I don't know. Um, I mean, so I'm not a prosecutor. I haven't been a prosecutor. But you can imagine in, in the Mississippi case, right, a three-year-old little girl was found um, in a creek outside the house, right? Mm -hmm. um, three months earlier, another three-year-old little girl was found in a pond outside of a house. There's a lot of pressure on a prosecutor to, to figure out who did it and to kind of protect the most fragile life, right? But with the guy with the Satan, I'm like, why would they go to such extreme, like, I, I just, it doesn't make sense to me why they would go to such extreme lengths to try to prove 
this, this should be capital. Is there a reason? <laughs> I mean, I How think the reason is, is, I mean, we could, we could give a lot of reasons, but um, the prosecutor's trying to sort out the worst of the worst, right? Mm -hmm. The worst of the worst in the early 90s in kind of rural Kentucky were these young men who people thought might be Satanists. Um, the worst of the worst at the time in Mississippi, some people thought the people who are who are killing, it's clearly a killing of this little girl. Um, they just latched on to the wrong person at the wrong time. <coughs> do, do the detaining facilities like uh, jails and, and stuff, um, is there a money differential between somebody that's a death row that, that somebody that's just you know, charged with a murder, not a capital murder, uh, for or housing them and stuff? Could that be an incentive too to push for capital? <coughs> It's actually more expensive to house an offender on death row than it is to house an offender in general population. So the so the, so the the state government could possibly, you know, charge more money for housing that inmate. Well, maybe there is this there is this kind of um, agency problem, right? The local prosecutor is the one who decides when to prosecute, what to prosecute. Um, the state is the one who is is. Um, um, there who has to, to pay the bill for the prisons, right? And so um, local prosecutor doesn't have the, the, to make the calculation, you know, are we incarcerating too many people at whatever, whatever level? Can I just add that most criminal cases actually don't go to trial. And so a key part of the prosecutor's charging strategy is to charge as much as the prosecutor possibly can, consistent with the law, in order to get a more favorable plea agreement. And so often, I think, trans, you know, making it a capital case uh, really increases your odds of getting a favorable plea out of the defendant who's seeking to avoid death. So I think that's probably one of the strategies. No, I think that could be true, ironically, in Mr. Hardy's case. Um, so I was a capital attorney before I was a project, attorney at the Innocence Project. If he were on death row, his case would have gotten more attention um, uh, than it did uh, because he wasn't on death row, right? Mr. Brewer got um, more attention because he was on death row than he, than he otherwise would have. Um, so I think that's right. It is part of the kind of charging analysis, but uh, it is also true that um, kind of the higher the stakes, the kind of more folks who are out there trying to make sure the system got it right. If I could add that too, by the way, for people that don't know, there's a, such a thing as called death qualified jury. If you seek a capital murder case, if you're going after the death sentence, everybody on that jury has to support the death penalty. There's actually a question during the board dire when you're coming up there to be on a jury that you say, do you support the death penalty? Can you carry it out? If you say no, you're not on that jury. That's certainly an advantage for a prosecutor to have everybody on the jury on a capital murder case when everybody in there supports the death penalty because usually that means they support the police and the prosecution and you wouldn't have been arrested if you didn't do so. So it's certainly an advantage for prosecution to go with the death penalty case and have a death qualified jury. That's practically undoubtedly the reason why the Marathon Bomber got to death mm -hmm. in Boston. Well, let's go to lunch. Before we leave, I would like to suggest that for the benefit of journalists, we come up with something, a list of um, the points that have to be established for scientific evidence to be allowed in the court. So we could produce something like the Miranda warning card with tips that journalists could look at for following testimony in court. And uh, it would aid them in writing their stories, making them more accurate, making them include ideas about the science involved. So I'd like to suggest that maybe um, going forward after this is through, that we think about that. Maybe some of us collaborate and coming up with some sort of an aid for journalists to understand how this works, maybe based on Dauber, the problems of the 